Hello, my name is Miss Kayla, the children's librarian at the Dubuque County Library, and this is Story Starters. The book I've got with me today is called The Nerviest Girl in the World by Melissa Wiley. I'm going to read the first few chapters and settle in at home and listen. The nerviest girl in the world. Prologue. If I'd been a dainty little thing like Mary Mason, I would never have found myself in such a predicament. Mary was the kind of kid they always pulled in for deathbed scenes. Sometimes she was in the bed, managing to look deathly pale and burning with fever all at once. And other times, she was the devastated younger daughter, crying her big old eyes out as father or mother murmured a last goodbye before croaking. Mary could turn on the waterworks as easily as shrugging. The second the director hollered, action, instant Niagara Falls. Me, on the other hand, I couldn't cry on, on cue to save my life. But you'd never catch Mary Mason climbing out of a hot air balloon 40 feet above the ground. I stared down at the patchwork world far below the swaying basket of my balloon. Jeepers, I was beginning to think that this time I might have bitten off more than I could chew. I was probably about to plummet to my death. Mr. Corrigan, the director, would probably just rush Mary in to blubber over my corpse while the light was still good. Go ahead, kid, he yelled from his nice comfy spot on the ground. It's now or never. Never sounded pretty good to me, I muttered but only in my head, because no matter how terror-struck I was up there in that balloon, the thought of ruining a shot was 80 times more terrible. I took a big, gulping breath of air, probably my last one ever, I figured, and grabbed hold of the anchor rope coiled on the floor of the basket. I heaved it over the side and braced myself for the lurch that would come when the anchor stretched the rope to its farthest point. I peered over the lip of the basket, but the rope was dangling directly below me, and I couldn't see if the anchor had touched ground or not. It didn't feel like it. Too much sway. Now just shinny down the rope, shouted Mr. Corrigan. Even through his megaphone, I could barely hear him. That's how high up I was. Far beneath me, the scrub oaks danced on yellow grass. A couple of crows zoomed past below, flicking their wings with effortless confidence. Show offs. Just shinny down. My Aunt Fanny. Easy for him to say from his nice safe perch on the ground. But there was no getting out of it now. I had to get down from the balloon somehow. It was shinny down the rope or live in this basket for the rest of my short life. I grabbed hold of the rope scratchy on my sweaty palms and said a little prayer in my head. I should have asked my grandmother who the patron saint of sliding down an anchor rope from a hot air balloon was. It's stalling, I told myself sternly and flung a leg over the side of the basket. The only good thing about being so high above the ground was that nobody could see at my petticoats. But flashing my under things to the crew was the least of my worries. My hands felt so slick, they might have been coated with oil. I wrapped a leg around the swaying rope, clung hard with my hands, and yanked the other leg over the basket. The balloon lurched again, harder than before, and I nearly lost my grip. I squeezed hard and felt the heavy rope bite into my hands. And a girl! blared Mr. Corrigan. Now give a good look around and then slide on down. That good look around nearly killed me. Somehow the ground seemed twice as far away now that I was out of the basket. The nice safe basket where at least I wouldn't die from an overabundance of palm sweat. But there was no going back to that rickety little nest. My only choice now was to scooch down the rope and get to the ground as quickly as possible. 
Well, maybe not that quick, I corrected myself. Falling to my death was probably the quickest way down. Hand under hand, I inched down the rope. I could have sworn it took me an hour at least to make my way down that blasted rope, but I found out later it was only a few minutes. By the time I felt the anchor with my feet, I'd lost most of the skin on my hands. I had a big stripe of rope burn across my cheek, and my heart had burst with terror a good seven or eight times. Now, Pearl, shouted Mr. Corrigan, you looked down and noticed the anchor didn't reach the ground. Give us a good look at your face. You're fearless and determined, remember? And then just jump the rest of the way. There he was again with that just. I'd just like to see him jump down from the top of a tree with a fearless expression. I had to be six or seven feet off the ground still. She'll break a leg, called the camera operator. I'll break her neck is more like it, I thought, and I let go of the rope. Chapter One. No one in my family had any thought of going into the pictures, not at first. We were ranchers, cattle and sheep mostly, plus the ostrich enterprise. I heard about moving pictures from kids at school, but I never saw one myself until after I'd played parts in half a dozen different reels. By then my brothers were on their way to becoming stars, the Daredevil Donnelly brothers a death-defying cowboy trio, which, of course, was a lot of piffle, death-defying my eyeball. They'd been racing horses across the Sharapel since before any of them wore shoes. Nothing death-defying about doing it on camera. Not compared, say, to leaping out the window of a burning building, but that's jumping ahead. We lived outside Lemon Springs, California, in the eastern part of the San Diego County. Our part of the county was thick with cottonwood, sagebrush, and yucca. Heaven for rattlers and the occasional tarantula. My mother taught me to set a horse at age three. She said it was safer than running around barefoot in snake country. By the time I was nine, I could ride as well as any of my older brothers, and I never had the benefit of trousers and spurs. I just hitched up my skirt and rode a straddle in bare feet. Why, I could ride standing up on a horse's back, holding on with my toes in the reins, if the terrain was pretty level, as long as I was well out of sight of my mother's line of sight. As long as I was well out of range of my mother's line of sight. My big brother's riding prowess is what got them noticed by the flying cue director. They were working cowboys, and I don't think any of them ever imagined a life in the limelight. Once or twice a year, they rode in local rodeos and usually snatched up most of the prizes. That was about as much fame as any Donnelly boy ever expected to experience. And then, one day, a month after my 11th birthday, a portly man in riding boots and breeches strode up to my oldest brother, Bill, after a calf roping exercise, shook his hand and said, Son, how would you like to pull that same stunt in a moving picture? Huh? replied Bill in his typically eloquent fashion. Name's Thorsten Corrigan, said the man. He had a confident mustache and a kind of fierce snap in his gaze. I direct moving pictures for the Flying Q Film Company. I'm looking for a couple of good writers for a Western we're shooting next week. Shooting? Echoed Bill. What's it pay? Asked my uncle. Asked my brother, Ike, elbowing in. He was sore at Bill for taking the first prize. Bill always took first in the roping events. But if there was a prize for getting straight to the point of a discussion, Ike would have taken it every time. Mr. Corrigan didn't bat an eye at Ike's directness. We pay handsomely for real talent, he answered smoothly. I need fellows who can ride like the blazes, and do some rope tricks on film. Real showy stuff. Plenty of panache. On film? exclaimed Bill. 
Like in the pictures? That's right, said Mr. Corrigan. Well, we ain't actors, chimed in my brother Frank. He was 16, with one pitiful mustache hair. For each year, more or less. I could see he was mighty impressed with Mr. Corrigan's bristle brush. I'm not looking for actors, son, replied Mr. Corrigan. I've got actors crawling out of my ears. I couldn't help but dart a glance at his ears then, even though I knew he was only being poetic. They appeared undisturbed. I need real cowboys. I pride myself on the authenticity of my pictures. Authenticity, I repeated silently in my head. It was what my father would call a five-dollar word. I had no idea what it meant, but I liked it. It sounded like a place I'd like to visit. By the end of that conversation, Mr. Corrigan had gotten himself invited to dinner at the ranch. By the end of that dinner, he talked my father into giving the boys a day off, their cattle work, to do some rope tricks in front of the flying Q camera. By the end of the week, all three of my brothers were roped into the motion picture business, just as firmly as any calf Bill ever lassoed with his eyes closed. And my father had to advertise for some new ranch hands. Chapter Two. Everyone around here thinks of life in two sections, like a two-reel picture, before flying Q and after flying Q. My mother tells me stories about how her family moved from Fletcher, Colorado to San Diego, California, when she was a little girl, about as old as I was, when the studio set up operations in Lemon Springs. She says all her memories are divided into before the move and after the move. I guess it'll be the same for me, only it's before the movies and after the movies. We stayed put in our same old ranch. I still have to get up and do my ostrich chores before breakfast, same as ever, but just about everything else in my life is different since flying Q sweep, swooped in. <laughs> I guess when I'm old like my mother, I'll be telling my kids before and after stories too, assuming I don't break my neck jumping onto a moving train first, or getting kicked in the head by an irked ostrich. Our ranch runs mostly to cattle, but we have one big pen beyond the kitchen garden for the ostriches. We raise some for meat and some for eggs, and all of them for their big plumy feathers, which fetch a pretty penny. Mama sells them to a hat maker in San Diego every year after molting season. We keep six or seven birds at a time, most of them females, because we rely on the eggs. One ostrich egg makes a scramble big enough to feed our whole family. Chicken eggs taste a heap better, though. My grandma, my grandmother says chicken egg scrambles are for fancy folk who have time to spend all day cracking shells. But I notice it doesn't take her all day to crack chicken eggs when she's making a cake. You'd have to make 10 cakes if you wanted to use an ostrich egg. The only catch is that with ostriches, unlike chickens, they don't lay eggs year round. Here's what your morning is like when you're the youngest kid in the family, meaning you're the one stuck tending the birds. They aren't like other ranch stock. No chum nuzzles like you get from the horses or placid indifference like cows and sheep. No, ostriches are nasty tempered she demons who'd as soon crack your skull as look at you. At least that's what my father says. He won't go near the birds. That's my wife's enterprise, he always says. She grew up ducking kicks from the she demons, just like me after the move, that is. That means she got a kind of a late start compared to me. I started feeding the birds and collecting their eggs when I was six years old. They mostly ignore me now. 
Ike says I'm so gangly and long-legged myself that they just think I'm one of them. But I still have to look sharp when I open the gate to their pen or Jezebel will charge me. She's the meanest she-demon of the bunch. The trick is to fill their food trough first, then unhook the latch to their coop with a big stick poked through the fence. And then after they've thundered out to bury their heads in breakfast, I creep around to the pasture gate and open it while they're occupied. After they eat, they stampede out to pasture and I use my stick to shut the gate behind them. Then I can clean the coop and in egg season, check for eggs in peace and quiet. Well, quiet at least. It's hard to feel exactly peaceful when you're shoveling fresh ostrich dung. When I'm finished, I carry the eggs into the kitchen where my grandmother takes them over. I get sent to wash up before breakfast. Nobody wants to sit down to a meal next to a girl who cleans the ostrich pen. It all goes in reverse in the evenings, except for the egg gathering and poo shoveling parts. Mama still makes me scrub my arms, face, and feet before I'm allowed to sit down to dinner. I used to think I must be the cleanest kid in San Diego County. Then I got to know Mary Mason. She bathes as much as I do, more since her baths are long soaks in a tub instead of hasty scrub downs with a rough towel like mine. And she doesn't get herself stunk up doing ostrich chores in between. From our ostrich pen, you can look east over the valley to Bitter Creek and the mountains beyond. The sun shoots over the mountains in the morning, right in time to jab my eyeballs with rays when I'm tending the birds. It sets over the Pacific Ocean, but we're almost 20 miles from the coast, and our ranch is too flat for a view. Once, when I'm six or seven years old, my father took my brothers and me to the top of Mount Caracol, a smallish mountain a little northeast of town, and we took in the view to the west, past Lemon Springs to San Diego, and beyond that, a glittering stripe of ocean. Papa lifted me onto his shoulders so I could see even farther. I remember how far away everything seemed. The ocean, the tall palm trees, the hills, even my brothers standing beside us seemed a long way down from my perch. From our ranch, the westward view is mostly just pasture land and scrub. In the mornings, a fresh, clean smell of sage sweeps across the Sharapel, and the comfortable sound of cattle drifts across the pastures. Every spring, the spiky yucca plants send up tall shoots of big, white, bell-shaped flowers. Grandma calls them Our Lord's Candle Plants. My brother Ike calls them Hell's Bells because the yucca leaves are sharp as needles and will slice your arm if you get too close walking by. But he never calls them that around our grandmother. Until Mr. Corrigan appeared in our lives, I didn't think much about the world beyond our ranch and Lemon Springs. My world was ostriches and horses and the rumble of cattle and the bleeding of sheep in school in the village and Sunday mass at the White Stucco Chapel. It felt pretty big to me back then, before Mr. Corrigan set me up in a hot air balloon and I saw our ranch way down below, looking about as big as a quilt square. When my brothers started riding horses and flying Hughes one-reelers, no one, least of all me, ever dreamed I'd wind up in pictures myself. I would bet a nickel my mother would have shut me in the closet before she'd ever let me near flying Q, if she could have foreseen the crazy things I would wind up doing. I might have shut myself in the closet if I'd known I'd wind up climbing out of a hot air balloon 40 feet above the ground. I'm glad we didn't know. Chapter 3 I got shot off his horse yesterday, said my brother Bill through a mouthful of egg. 
about a week after the boys started working for Mr. Corrigan. Good heavens, cried my grandmother, her fork clattering to her plate. Just pretend shot, Grandma, Ike assured her. I don't know why she was so worried in the first place. If you've been really shot, I don't think you'd sit down to the dinner table nice and casual and snatch the biggest piece of ham off the platter. For the picture, Bill added superfluously. That was a splendid tumble you took, Ike, said my brother Frank admiringly. I thought you'd broken your neck for sure. Good heavens, shouted my mother and grandmother in unison. My father slowly set down his mug, eyeing Ike appraisingly. Mama rose hastily to her feet, her chair scraping on the floor, snatched up the coffee pot and stormed into the kitchen. Frank stared after her with an anxious gaze, but Ike went on sh shoveling scrambled eggs and fried ham into his face. Why is everyone in such a stew? asked Bill. Suppose, said my father slowly, you tell us exactly what it is this fella Corrigan has you boys doing out there. In the kitchen, a pot clanged hard on the iron stove. Oh, I'd swell, Papa, said Ike eagerly. Mostly we ride hard in a pack of other cowboys and wave shotguns around. Don't worry, they ain't loaded. But whatever the picture calls for a fancy stunt, Corrigan has me or Frank or Bill do it. We can outdo those other fellows by a mile. Don't boast, Isaac, snapped Grandma. Her mouth was pressed into a tight, thin line. You ain't boasting, Grandma, said Ike, brushing a brown curl off his forehead with the back of his hand. It's a plain truth. The rest of them can't, can ride all right if the terrain's level. But if you need someone to take a spill or switch horses in the middle of a hard gallop, Ike, muttered Frank in a warning tone, but Ike ignored him. And you want a Donnelly on the spot. What the blazes kind of picture is this? demanded Papa. Sounds more like a circus act. Jesus, Mary and Joseph, interjected my grandmother, making the sign of the cross. They're westerns, Papa said Frank. That's why these picture people came looking for rodeo champions. It's a display of horsemanship. In the kitchen, my mother snored it. I couldn't help but let out a snicker. Ike shot me a glare. I quickly blanked my face and busied myself spreading manzanita jelly on a biscuit. Mm-hmm, murmured my father. I could see he was skeptical. I spooned another dollop of jelly on my biscuit, figuring everyone was too distracted to notice. Thanks, Papa. You're the one who taught us how to take a spill without breaking a bone, Ike pointed out. That was a safety precaution, Papa snapped. Everyone takes a tumble now and then. Best to know how not to get yourself killed. I sure as heck didn't expect you'd be going out of your way to fall on purpose, though. Jacob, language, said my grandmother. My brothers all burst out laughing. It was always so funny when Grandma scolded Papa like he was a naughty child, especially since she was Mama's mama, not his. I took advantage of the distraction to sneak another spoonful of jelly. I didn't have much biscuit left at this point, and the jelly slid down around the edges of my fingers. That's too much jelly, Pearl said my mother sternly. I always forgot she has eyes of a hawk and can see through walls. She stalked to the table with a fresh pot of coffee and slammed it down in front of Ike. Piggy Pearl, teased Ike. Frank made an oinking sound, turning glare from me. Frank's teasing always had a different flavor somehow from Ike's. With Ike, you felt like you were in on the joke. With Frank, you weren't quite sure he was teasing. Maybe he really did think I was a pig. Don't you try to change the subject, Papa told Ike. I need assurance that this work isn't putting my sons in danger. We're careful, Papa, said Frank. The old boy, as he brought us in, because we can do tricks without breaking a sweat. 
It's nothing out of the ordinary for us, but I guess it looks tip top on camera. Plus, the pay is fine, said Bill placidly. My mother rolled her eyes. The pay will do you no good if you're dead of a broken neck. You're waiting until you see the picture, Mama, said Ike. You'll be bursting with pride. Hmm, my mother said, unconvinced. Pearl, go wash the jam off your face. You look like you took a bath in it. Yes, ma'am, I sighed. Ike gave me a wink. He's my teasing guest brother, but also my most sympathetic one. Whenever I get into a scrape, he's the best person to ask for help getting out. I do blame him, though, for my lifelong horror of caterpillars. Because of the time, he climbed a tree and dropped a nasty, spiky one on my head as I walked underneath his branch. Of course, that was a long time ago, when I was just a little kid. But some things you never forget, and the feeling of a million scrabbly little legs on your head is one of them. The oozy splat after you clap a panicked hand to your head is another. But as long as there were no caterpillars in sight, Ike was a swell brother. Anyway, he was practically grown up now, almost 18, and not likely to terrorize me with creepy crawlies anymore. I don't think. Well, I believe I'll ride to town this morning and take a gander at this nothing out of the ordinary with my own eyes, said Papa. My brothers exchanged uneasy glances but said nothing. You just watch out. That smooth-talking Corrigan man doesn't rope you in too, Jacob, said my grandmother. That man's so slick. He'll have you dancing a tarantella on horseback if you don't keep your wits about you. The image was so comical, I couldn't help but burst out with a hoot of laughter. Ike met my eyes, grinning. I said go wash up, Pearl, roared my mother. I hastily scooted out of my chair and went out to the pump to wash, but not until I'd licked up every smidgen of jelly that I could reach with my tongue. It's a sin to waste good manzanita jelly. So I will stop there. That was the first three chapters of our book for today. So the book was The Nerviest Girl in the World by Melissa Wiley. We have this book here at the library, so if you'd like to find out what happens, please stop on by and check it out. Thanks so much for joining me today. Bye.